dramatically, but with it came packing the suitcase, following a dream, and ultimately landing up in California. The name of the man, Monty Roberts. We called it a little bit of pre-fame because 1997, although the Queen of England had endorsed him and the book, The Man Who Listens to Horses, had come out in huge waves, as well as the horse was removed, not based on Monty Roberts, it was still a wave that could be ridden by many and it was more accepted. I ended up in California. I ended up changing a career from a first responder to becoming a groom, not something that the family would appreciate and somewhat frowned upon to leave a husband, a horse, a dog, a career home in England and follow a heart, but that's exactly what I did. And with that, the doors began to open and the doors to natural horsemanship opened to me at the right beginning of where the movement began. I became the head instructor at Monty Roberts. I developed a lot of programs there, rode the babies, did the racehorses, did the rehab, took horses to the sales and changed a lot of my beliefs and my knowings from what was traditional or what we call traditional, it became something a little, a little different, right? Because we integrated the horse's language in. I'm kind of encapsulating it here for you all to say here was a child that grew up in a perfect way in nature, went to England, back to England, and became the person that commuted, commuted and saw the horse when and if possible. Then I went to California, left it all behind and began to see a whole new way of being. The new way of being was observing the language of the horse, ultimately. Now, I'm going to jump forward just a little bit with you here, Teresa. But with that, it included a passion for wild horses. And ultimately, in 19, what was it, 1999 um, ish, I would have been traveling the globe now looking for the language of the horse. So in China, Mongolia, in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, my life path has taken me all around the world to look at the Premarin horses, that's pregnant mares urine, their wild horses, look at the tribal horses in the United States, as well as going as far away as around the globe to say, let's look at this language of the horse. How natural is it? Is it universal? Is it predictable and discernible? Can we speak the same language to a foal through to a geriatric, a wild horse through to a domestic horse? And what does that truly look like? And why, why does it even apply to us as horse lovers, amateurs through to professionals? What does it mean to us? So I'm hoping that kind of fills it in a little bit mm -hmm. for you to say, this is what I was led by I was actually led by not only the call of the horse, but a lot of it was about justice to give a voice to the horse. Be it in rescue, sanctuary situations, or indeed any situation where I've been fortunate now to judge on events from cult starting or be present on liberty events. And for me, it's always been about that voice for the horse. What's that horse saying? How can we improve their lives? How can we hear them? Is it all with the eyes? Is it with the heart? What does their language entail? And the language entails body language, which is a big piece. Many people have become familiar with it. There's two folds to that. One piece is our body language. What are we portraying? What are we saying through dropping a shoulder or dropping our eyes? The other part is their body language. And how do they talk through the swish of the tail or the whisper in the eye? The other piece is the herd dynamic though. That's part of the language too. The personality of each individual horse, part of the language. One that goes unseen would be the energy. When we enter a room, who do we like? Who do we dislike? Who do we connect with? The same with horses. When we enter that barn or that yard, there's that energetic connection that they're seeking. It actually speaks before we do. They can tell it upon movement, but it's not movement alone. It really is a piece that we call intention or agenda or that feeling that we possess. That energetic piece is huge in the horse's language and really all too often it gets overlooked or not 
mentioned. I'm giving you the two pieces before I go into the next piece so that you can either go deeper or ask a different way. But those are the two pieces. I studied the behavior in the language of the horse from Monty Roberts originally, but then left there in 2003 and began to work with hundreds of Mustangs in my time. I've gentled thousands now, but hundreds of wild horses, Mustangs, Brumbies, no matter what we call it, the, the wild one, their language is at this rawest. They're the ones that are the Wikipedia of the horse world because they're so attuned to what are you thinking through your eye or your minute movement as well as that intention. And for anybody that gets the opportunity to work with or gentle a wild horse, that's where telepathy and energy really, really plays a big part because you wouldn't be able to get close to them otherwise. Okay, so my so follow-up okay, so my so my follow-up things excuse the reverb, excuse the reverb was gonna be who in, was gonna be who today, but perhaps it's not other people like Monty Roberts, but the horses themselves. You know, it's a big one. The the person that influenced me greatly was Crawford Hall. Crawford was Monty Roberts farm manager for twenty eight years, and I worked very closely alongside him because Monty was on the road so much. And it wouldn't be right, like you're saying, we're going back to 2003, and that was a chapter in my life, but then there's more chapters. And so it's too easy to say the horses are our teachers because every horse we are around or every class that we're teaching, of course, they're going to always be the teacher. But at the same time, there's gonna be some that, that mirror back, reflect back what we want to to be and how we want to respond in the world today. For me, the thoroughbreds would be your closest towards the wild ones. So people that have that thoroughbred or you go to Ireland and you go to wonderful parts in the UK to see the wild horse because you capture the wisp in the eye. So arguably the greatest influences are the horses, but that alone wouldn't be it because we could stop in our tracks and all too many times you see people delve into horsemanship and they think they have the answer or they have it all. So there has to be this internal drive to also say, I wanna get gentler or I wanna do it differently or I know this doesn't feel right anymore. So when we go back to the 1990s, a lot of the horsemanship is dominance based. It's a structure, it's a system. A, B, C, the horse has to comply the horse has to fall, come into this fold and to really get the release, be that science too, to go, he does this, I do this. But I was intrigued by all of that to say, okay, I hear that, but, but what, if? what if? What if the three second rule doesn't apply? What if I can make an impact through my mind? What if the energetic connection could gentle a horse and it's got nothing to do with advance and retreat? What if I sit quietly here and my agenda changes. So the horses have influenced everything for sure. But the personal drive to give them that voice to say their language goes far deeper. The body language is the obvious. It's a language in itself and it could take decades to learn because a horse is a horse is a horse and yet a foal responds differently to a geriatric and a wild horse different to a domestic horse. And at the same time, if we don't look inside to go, that doesn't feel right to me, like it doesn't feel right to flag a horse. It doesn't feel right that it's simply advance or retreat. What about their eye? What are they really saying? And what if we don't have to repeat things like the system state? A lot of the influence would be my mind. A lot of the influence would be traveling to go to China and to see how are you treating a horse? or Canada, how are you treating Spain, England, Sweden, Norway, France? What is it you need and how do you behave and how can we mesh it? And that would mean a horse could have a different perception to a human. So let's look at bringing the two on the same page. So I would say the influence could be the people because they're seeking gentler ways, could be the people misinterpreting, could be the people looking for that heart connection and equally as much, it's the horses, often for a horse whisperer, they're crying out to be heard. So 
so what would a um so somebody comes to you and they, they want to learn from you and they want a deeper relationship with their horse typically what would a session with you look like what would somebody expect so the typical piece is interesting because there isn't a typical there is no typical because we're looking at gentling foals, gentling mustangs, colt starting, intuitive riding, problem solving, you name it. So no typical, right? But at the same time, you're right. Doesn't matter who they are, when they come, they'd be expressing themselves. So the first thing would be for them to share, what is your interpretation of the situation? I wanna hear from you. And they would introduce themselves to say, I am such such, I've been in the horse world this long and this is what I'm experiencing. So now I've heard what you've said and now I'll let the horse talk. And so there's different ways to evaluate or assess. If we're looking at horsemanship, because I'm gonna go in two different categories now. If we're looking at the horsemanship piece, then we're looking at, could I assess them, evaluate through liberty work? Because if there's no lines attached, they're naked, it's one-on-one, -on -one. you're looking for that true conversation. And if I'm able to take them into an environment where they can move freely, we're looking at hundreds of questions back and forth. Think of it this way, if this hand asks them to move, you're saying, could you move your nose out? How fast could you move your nose out? Are you able to spread your feet out? How sensitive are you? How much attention can you pay? These are all questions that you're asking. We can evaluate at liberty, in hand, under saddle. We can look at the individual problem and even how the two people mesh because that horse might respond quite differently to me than they might with the legal guardian. What it isn't, it's not about blaming the horse to go, it's his fault or his doing this. Let's look at what involvement we have and how we can change ourselves. Maybe we need to be more present, more alert, have more in our toolbox. That'd be one typical way but if we're looking at the animal communication there's nothing so typical about it either because i can be here in colorado at my home and this is the glory i'll tell you of the coronavirus in that sense if no i cannot go out necessarily and fly around the world right now but what we can do is create events online animal communication there is no time limit there's no space limit you can talk to an animal from this living room here, across the county line, across the states, the United States and the continent. There's no such thing as a limit. So with animal communication, you, for example, Teresa, might say, I'd love you to connect with my animal, my horse. You would give me merely two sentences because that's about your perception. You could turn around saying, I'm finding and have a challenge right now we're not connecting. It could be that you say, he started bucking for no reason. Well, there's always a reason behind everything. It could be pain, tack, we could do the list, right? Let's, let's take bucking for an example. As a horse whisperer, we'd be looking at the teeth, the tack, we'd be looking at the saddle fit, the environment, even the breed, the food of the individual that they're getting, the rider match, energetic, um, component as well as even the seasons we could go on right so let's say there's 15 reasons a horse might buck as a horse whisperer I'd have to check them all I'd have to check the tack fit I'd have to check the way you ride the pain chiropractic veterinary care all of it as an animal communicator I don't need to go down that route I can go to the horse's mouth go straight to the horse to say hey share with me what's going on now like you and I as a human, we have a choice. You might need the trust to build further. You might want to share something totally different first. And the animal always has a voice for as long as they want it. Once we get there, I bring the client in too. So what I don't do, it's not, it's not like a fake, fake person or a fake psychic. You're not looking at you going, so tell me, have you just changed your saddle? And have you had the vet out lately? Is there pain in his back? There's none of that. It's funny, I go into that Essex accent when I do that one. <laughs> Drop into that. But it's not like I'm looking for a response from your body language to go, oh, I saw in your eye she's had the vet out. I'm not looking at that. Neither am I looking for a video. So I don't say, send in a video, let me assess him, and I'll tell you as a communicator what's going on. None of that. 
Now, in fact, on the screen here, you have me with Excalibur. He's a Spanish Mustang. All people have to do is send in the headshot, not with anybody else present, so not like me riding bareback, but just the headshot. There are no action movies. There's no descriptive photo with tack on that you go, oh, I'm thinking you're riding Western. It's merely a headshot. Through the connection, they can share their lifestyle and even the interaction that they have with their person. And then we could, as a horse whisperer, I can get into detail. So this is the glory, Teresa, the fact that I do both. I'm recognized pretty high in my profession as a horse whisperer. I've, I've got that art down, but now combine that with the animal communication, really mesh it like this, you've got unique fields coming together. Rarely do you find one person doing both. It's a huge benefit because let's say that horse doesn't want to voice it. And here's the difference between a horse and a dog or a cat or another species. One, no hoof, no horse. So if that horse is lame, he could be concerned that if he reveals lameness, this is the end of his career or indeed lifestyle or home. Very different than a dog. The dog will reveal lameness, he knows he's gonna be okay. So now they could be hiding that. And on top of it, what does it mean to the horse? If they're in performance, will that person give him up? Is his career over? Or does he even know what's happening for him? See, what we don't want to do is simply give them a voice where they say, I'm bucking because I'm feeling fresh. Fantastic. You're entirely right. It's springtime. You feel good. But what if that's only one of multiple reasons? See, it would be remiss of us then to simply deliver that information to say, well, he shared it's springtime. That's it. No, nope, not me. Not me as a first responder. I've learned to interview correctly. But also I dig a little bit deeper. I want to know, are there other factors? Because that's one. And as a horse whisperer, because I have that list of 15 things, I'm able to bring that in too. To go share with me about your saddle fit. Share with me about your teeth. Share with me how you feel physically. Are there any aches or pains? And would this contribute to the bucking? So therefore, the combination allows for a very thorough consult and to get to the bottom of things. I've answered it two ways. One, very minorly as a horse whisperer, but then also accentuating the piece of the combination of animal communication for you. Anna, can I just ask a question actually? Does, does there yes, have to be an issue or can you actually just have a consultation because you wanna communicate with your horse? Any reason, it's really lovely. And you know, I'm smiling because the easiest ones are the people that just wanna communicate. That's my easy face to go, great, we're going to connect. It's going to be a fun time. Horse can say whatever he or she wants. It's fantastic. And so here are common reasons. Somebody might turn around and state, I've just got a new horse. Can we connect with him and find out what he wants? It might be, I've had him for 10 years. I'd love to know how he feels about me. Could be about the riding. I've been riding. And this is the thing they'll give you, the list. And I don't know if I can stand up here. I'll go back a little bit. I can, yeah, you can see me. So for example, when you connect with them, you could, and I always stand up when I'm looking at how does the rider feel, because you can feel it in your body. And I could ask them, share with me how it feels to have the rider on your back. And you'll feel if there's more weight in one stirrup mm -hmm. or another. You'll feel if there's a little twist in the pelvis, you'll feel the hands to the mouth. So I've had, I mean, 10,000 consults. So it's hard to sort of pick one. One, I forget most of them. Um, and I think that's the privy of, of client privileges and privacy, you forget it. But at the same time, you remember some. And I've been fortunate to talk to Olympic horses and dressage horses and show jumping, you name it. And it's really neat when they get to a certain level in their career and maybe the trainer was state, not necessarily a problem, but maybe their state, we're trying to get them to the next level dressage, but he hates whips. Can you tell me the reason why and how do we get through it? So it can be a problem. It could be a physical issue. Could be simply checking in that you've changed barns, that you've had a loss of another animal, that they're new to the barn, that they're new to you. What is their roommate? Do they like their room with a view? What about the nutrition? Are we covering all of the nutrition? 
their exercise could be very, very generic. It might be, and this is a big category, that people are looking at when is the right time for them to transition. Often you hear the statements, oh, you'll know. The, the truth is you don't always know. And it's deceiving with the horse. There's countries, there's countries that believe a horse can't be lame. And if they're lame, they need to be euthanized. There's countries of people, so millions of people that think that, when in fact, you know what? If we euthanize everybody that was lame, we wouldn't have a population anymore. Oh, the gone. humans would be, <laughs> and I'd be one of the first. Yeah. And yet, <laughs> you mean right you look at it and go well, how many things have i got wrong so it's not true there's certain individuals that can grow old and they could have ring bone on an avicular and laminitis and we can get them through it and it's interesting again excalibur that's on that picture he's had laminitis two times now 100 percent recovery 100 percent recovery and and i believe that's partially animal communication because you can pull out those stops to go what is it you need what am i missing how can I help you? Um, and you can let them know too, I'm not attached to the outcome. You're in my life unconditionally. No matter what happens, you're here. And so there's there's nothing you cannot do, okay? There's nothing. If there's any reason as a human you talk to another girlfriend to go for a drink or vent or find out is there something wrong between us or just simply say I'm calling because I love you, everything that we do with a person we can do with an animal every single conversation and they're, they're so intuitive really? aren't they as an animal horses you know i mean my my fellow just he reads me like a book um more, i think more than a lot of animals so i compare it to dogs because most horse people will have dogs or cats and the dog is so damn loyal that that he would be so loyal that things could go awry or amiss because he's going to love you anyway but the horse pretty much will reflect things. So there will be horses that you're going to the barn with a ton of baggage and they'll turn around and go, oh, not today, thank you, because you're not in the present time. You're not really in the right frame of mind. And I go back to Carrie when I said to you, she was the reason I was looking for natural horsemanship. I had three months off um, on like sick leave, say sick leave, sick leave with the, with the police force and i wanted her to be everything i wanted her to heal me and i'm doing it again like that because i wanted her to love on me and embrace me and be kind on me and she wasn't she did the opposite she put the bar high and i thought you're not helping me heal and it took me years because nobody revealed it. it took me years to discover yeah. but she was she was saying you're not fit to ride she's saying you're not fit to jump right now you're you're not really in your body and you're upset and the best way I can protect you is not to ride, but I didn't know that. And everybody around me would just go, use the whip on her, tell her she has to. And I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't know what to do. And so that's what's led me to the natural horsemanship, but the animal communication so much more, because now if you're at a wit's end with something, for example, and you don't know where to go, as a, as a human, as a person, there's no limits with animal communication because the time isn't a limit, like time change doesn't matter. There's no border, that doesn't matter. We can talk to them at any point in time. It's only as good as the communicator though. That's a big deal. It could be really superficial where somebody simply comes back and says, but well, your horse, this is a funny one, but your horse loves the color purple. We get that sometimes if they want the matching stuff. I'm not a matching kind of girl. I just do the Western. But on times they'll come back with, I want the matching halter, I want the lead rope. And it's cute because their guardian is the type of guardian that does that. They want to show the love. They want to have that childhood dream by having the matching colors. And so it's kind of a superficial piece of conversation, but it could mean the world to an individual. And we don't sit in judgment to say this is good or bad or ugly. It just simply is. And the hardest thing to do as a horse whisperer or horse behaviorist is to step out the way and not put your, your projection onto it. Because of course, you give me a video, I can tell you what's going on with that horse pretty much, but this isn't about that. This is about stepping away and allowing the individual animal okay. to speak. Um, <laughs> 
Sorry, have you got anything you I thought you were going to say something Teresa there. I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, that's okay. I have yeah, I have um, another question. I wanted to move on to the um, the 101 things you can do with your horse. And um, are these interesting in that I think that's a program that came out long before the pandemic. But I think as people have been locked down and they've been trying to decide, do I ride my horse? Do I do the groundwork? Um, that, you know, perhaps there's opportunities now for people to, to do something different. And, you know, such a big opportunity. And I designed it. It's the 30 years of horsemanship to look at it, to say I'm flying, flying all over the world. Right. And what are the commonalities here? So one would be that some of them have just been to Singapore and concrete city. So the question would be, what can we do to enhance our horses lives? But the same would be I go to New York and the clients say our horse is brought to us, packed up. So actually we only know them under saddle and I'll go somewhere else. A novice says, what can I do? And the other individual, I have a retired horse. I can't ride somebody else with a foal, somebody else with rehab. So what happened was I thought the world over, the commonality is the factor that people say, don't know what else to do other than ride. And I thought, and there is riding involved by the way, but I thought let's create 101. Cause I keep on saying to my clients, but there's a hundred things to do with your horse. What's wrong? You can't be bored. And it doesn't matter if the weather's bad or if they're too young, too old, too sick. There's always something to do with your horse, but we don't know what. So it was born out of that to say, let's bring in all of my methodology here to state we can have it all. And no matter who you are or where you are in the world, you'll find some of these exercises. I could have, it would have been too much of a mouthful, called it 101 natural horsemanship things to do with your horse. But it, how long do you want the title to be? So what happens is we've integrated relaxation techniques in there. We've integrated intuitive riding. Quite different really than simple riding, it's intuitive riding, it's riding with the mind, it's riding with energy. I brought in the energy healing, so energy healing for horses, telepathy, trick training, play, liberty, relaxation. So these are some of the topics that are included. So imagine that, we can do dancing with horses, have two horses in the round pen together. It's incredible looking at the language of the horse, not a system, not you've got to go eight laps one way, eight the other, but let's dance with them. What about an obstacle course at Liberty, the life lessons that they give us, all included. And I wanted to take it on horseback because of course the majority want to ride. And so we have some reining, one rein stop, intuitive riding, riding on the buckle, really fun, a few of the 101 things that you can do with your horse. There's an infusion of telepathy. The language of the horse goes way beyond the scene. The things we see would be the body language. We can tell that, you know, that's kind of easy, even if it takes a long time to do the ear, I'm paying attention. The ear I'm following, paying attention. But we're looking at the eye. The eye could be inquisitive. The eye could be absent. The eye could be involved. The eye could be worried. The eye could be mad. Hopefully you could see the change in my eye. All it takes is a thought to go, you know what, that, I don't know if pissed off is okay to say that, but you know that pissed me off and then the eyes got mad. So what we're doing with horses and horse whispering, we're doing the same. We're watching that eye to go, well, I think he's mad just there. Or, oh, he's not gotten it. He's confused. He's looking around, he's confused. All of this is body language. We have to learn it. We have to learn to read their eye and know how to respond. Huge part of it, capturing the whispers in the eye. And one of my quotes is, the whispers in the eye, not the butt. So many people are watching horses' butts. The whisper's not there. It's here, it's here. You don't, you don't sign for the deaf looking at people's bottoms. You sign for the deaf looking at their eyes. So horse whispering is all about eye contact and knowing when to look down, when to look at the eye, how to say thank you with the eye, how to drive a horse into different gait speeds with the eye. That's all the visual. The non-visual is the telepathy. And that's the piece that doesn't always get spoken about. And it's about learning to control your mind 
and know how to transfer the picture to the horse and receive the pictures or the innate knowing from the horses. And then these are all pieces that I included on there. I wanted people to have fun and I wanted it to be affordable, honestly. So where DVDs, for example, my DVDs that are an hour, hour and a half in length cost anything up to a hundred dollars, we made this affordable to say, here's 101 things, you get six DVDs included. They're a little bit older now, but they're still relevant. And you get 101 things affordable. So I think with the DVDs, it works out to maybe a dollar a piece. So you're getting an exercise that won't overwhelm you. I could have called it 10 Minute Horseman Teresa. The whole second piece of this was people all around the world would come back with, I don't have enough time. And you think, but you got 10 minutes, don't you? Can we make 10 minutes? And so each segment is around the 10 minute mark that you can watch. You can put it on the phone. You can take it with you to the barn. It's a drip campaign. We don't overwhelm you. You don't have access to 101. It takes 52 weeks for you to get 101 things. You get two a week. They're 10 minutes per episode. And I feel that everybody can find that 10 minutes to view it. The other thing is not everything applies, right? You might say, I'm never gonna pony my horse. I can't ride and take another one. We'll skip that one then. You know, skip it to the next one and go, chalk that up to experience, I don't need it. And then you look at it again and go, okay, well, grooming. Am I grooming and I'm going through the actions and that's all I'm doing or am I doing mindful grooming? And what does that even mean to me? Watch the episode, come back to the episode, watch it the following year. You own it for life. So that means that you get different horses in, you can have it. If you turn around, share it with a friend. I just released um, an email and I went, here's all the ideas with it. Do a virtual meeting, have a party together online, get a chat group going, um, find a trainer to do the same thing with so that you guys can hone in on these skills. And if you're looking to be introduced to the next generation of natural horsemanship, the next generation that includes energy and telepathy, this is it. I'm a strong believer you won't find it anywhere else. So this is the horsemanship technique that you're looking for to include telepathy. Oh, I've lost sound. <laughs> well, there you go, okay. go back. Um, okay. <laughs> it was me. <laughs> it was me. Um, particularly with the telepathy piece, um, I imagine there's a lot of people thinking, oh, I, I can't do that. So. Do you think anyone can do it with the right? I do, I call it your birthright. And it's an interesting one to look at birthright. But, but the truth is, everybody that comes to my class will get a connection. And that means that it doesn't matter how old. My youngest has been seven, although my son is seven now and he's been doing telepathy since he could talk. But in a class type situation, seven year olds have been in there and I've had people into their 90s. So age doesn't matter, sex does not either. Although these kind of classes attract more women and maybe 10, 20% men, doesn't matter. And skeptics, I've had the cowboys, you know, if you wanna see it, it's the cowboy cheering going, yeah, go on last, you know, basically this ain't working. And it doesn't matter if you're skeptical or not, you can still connect. So everybody can connect. Your easiest comparison would be this to think about. Think about a time where you picked up the phone and your girlfriend has said, I was just about to call you. Think of the time where you've gotten online together and you realize you're being called. This is a form of telepathy. The love you have for a child, the love you have for a sibling, a twin, a parent, that connects you together through telepathy. Maybe you don't know why you wandered home and you found somebody that needed you. So now let's move it into the animals. There's times for everybody that's listening into this that you can relate to it to say, I showed up and my horse was already at the gate. How did he know that I was coming? Did he hear the vehicle on the freeway, on the highway, or did he know? Did you really come at the same time? Because we can always justify it to say, well, every day at four I come, well, maybe then there's a system. But what if he came anyway? Have you ever gone to the barn where that horse needed you? You found out that they were three-legged lame or that they had a tummy upset and you didn't know why you turned up there. 
these are all the telepathy. Another one, a bit lighter versus the pain, another one would be when you're riding the horse and if you love the arena and you're thinking about putting in the canter and he does it. How many people have been told, don't let him do that, don't let him canter now? I do. I tell my students, the first thing I say is, what were you thinking? Well, I was thinking of canter. Well, then we're not going to reprimand him. He picked up on your thought. You've got to be responsible for your thoughts. So they will pick up on those thoughts immediately. So if you're thinking it, and the key when you're doing animal communication in action is to be in the now and the not too distant future. You can't be too far ahead because that horse will be doing that. So you've got to really stay present and it's a great exercise in staying present. There isn't anybody that can't do it. There's things that will stand in your way, beliefs can stand if in your way. And if you turn around and say, I simply don't believe this, well, you could have a block. If you turn around and say, it's too far fetched for me or I need science behind it, there's a ton of science behind animal communication. And the truth is, how many cases do you need to have done, i.e. 10,000, does that count? Does that count as a scientific record now when we have papers that only count with 10 horses? There's a track record. And so absolutely, we have the science from it that horses see in pictures, we know that. Humans see in pictures, not every human knows it, but we know that both parties see in pictures. So all it takes is the piece in between to be able to connect them. Compare it to a satellite dish. You have a satellite, and you have a TV. If you just have the two pieces of equipment, the TV doesn't work. You need an engineer to put the two together, where well, you've got the horse and you've got the human. In this case, the engineer would be me to tell you, this is what you have to do. You have to quieten your mind, drop into your heart, and project that thought to the individual. That's how they hear you. But first off, you've got to learn to listen. And the listen isn't in the spoken words. It's not even in the behavior. The listening is shutting your eyes, maybe, feeling it in your heart, seeing a movie, hearing something that you know is not you. That's the big piece. So that feeds into it. We've had a question which says, um, do horses speak different languages depending on their country of origin? They do not. It's very interesting and it goes across board to all species so i travel to denmark france sweden norway switzerland all these great places china even and um, mongolia we could go on and every place if the person doesn't speak english i have a translator there so imagine that you've got the horse the translator me if the person speaks english we're good it comes from the horse to me me to the person if not translated to the person. So it's a universal language because it's unspoken and it's telepathy, meaning one mind to another. It could be pictures, could be movies, could be an innate knowing, automatic speech, automatic writing, automatic movement. It might even be dream state or symbols. There's many other things it comes in too, but this is how you're learning it. The language is unique to you. So that's the big thing, unique to you. So what I can't do is say, Kate, watch the movie that comes through, because if you guys don't have movies, you'd have to learn it in a different style. You've got to learn the unique language That's really interesting, you, but it's universal. As I said to you before we started, I've delved into a little bit of this, and I've really started to be, I'm quite intuitive and empathic as a person anyway, so I go on my gut an awful lot. I've really started to pay attention to Archie and um, I have a health condition which requires me to have many a trip to hospitals, the girls will tell you. Um, and I used to feel really guilty about that on days where my yard used to step in. Since sort of being more mindful with him, I have found that if I just spend five, ten minutes and kind of really visualise where I know he'll be and it isn't pictures, and explain to him where I am. I know this sounds silly. Well, it's not silly, but I explain to him where I am and why I'm not going to be there today and that the yard are going to take care of him and I'll see him soon, but that I'm fine. I don't have the behaviours in him that I used to when I ever had a, a prolonged spell away. Does that make any sense? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think the contrast is this. Often we, we hear that maybe they can't understand time, but they can. You can tell them, I will be there at five o'clock and in your mind, hold the picture five and they'll know you're coming. What I think people get confused with, they might expect the response to go, well, he wasn't at the gate. Well, you know what? How many times is your husband not arriving on time or your lover, your partner? Do you turn around and go, well, that didn't work. So I think what we are designed to do is go, I did this, the animal should have done that. Well, they would have heard you, but they don't have to do what you say. So the big thing is to know they understand time. They understand whereabouts and they pretty much will know an awful lot about you. And if you show them, I was at hospital, I'm not feeling well, I need support, they will help you. I had a client in Norway, beautiful girl. She had a condition where she was not allowed to be knocked in any way. And she had a fjord and, um, and he knocked her, he knocked her, she had the bucket and he knocked her over and she was really disappointed by the behavior. And I connected with him and his response was, I was trying to tell her not to <laughs> carry the buckets. I knocked her to say what you shouldn't be doing. But for us, of course, we look and go, well, he was rude, he was disrespectful, he was not listening to boundaries. He's coming back with, but she told me she was ill. I pushed her over to say, you shouldn't be doing it. So there's always that different perception that if we're coming from our mindset and our experiences, there's only a certain way we know it to be. We've got to open our mind up to realize that there's more to this. They're not just into freedom, reproduction and eating. They have roles in our lives. There's no such thing as a coincidence. They come to us specifically. We are there to learn something or be on a parallel path with them. And it's nice to even hear from them. What is it you want out of life? I mean, how many people even think about that? We've got, we've got nine horses on the property. And the biggest thing is, what is it you want? I've got one, she's just got severely injured. And Sage always wanted to be an ambassador, always to reach out to horses. Well, the first ambassador is Excalibur. <clears throat> and he's starting to sidestep. <clears throat> so she wants to come in. She got injured and I thought, is her dream now broken? It's crying my heart out going, oh my God, her dream's over. But then you've got to remember, this is her, potentially her destiny. And she is a warrior. She was orphaned at four days of age. And so the greatest gift we gave her was to be in a herd and learn to be a horse. And she's been chomping at the bit to be an ambassador. She will heal, she will heal. And she'll have an incredible story to help others being an orphan and a severe injury, etc. So a lot of this is about going with the flow of life, speaking through your heart, realizing that they're incredible sentient beings, knowing that they too have the hopes and dreams. They're not here for our beck and call. They're not here to comply or be a commodity. They feel like we do. And the more we can open up to all species, not just horses, the better we become as a human because it changes our whole paradigm. That's what animal communication truly is. Amazing. Does. Thank you. Do we have two? So know that even if you're not sure if he's heard you, he will have heard you. Oh, yeah, you. definitely. He definitely. will I, hear I, you. I agree with and you on that. And um, yeah, it's like you say, it's all animals as well, isn't it? My dog, I saw him advertised as a rescue and I just knew he was my dog. I, I, I just knew from a picture. So he was the nosy husky that was trying to get on camera earlier. So, again, he found me. But... Yeah. Did you say husky? Yeah, you did. Okay. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, they represent, the huskies often represent freedom. And so it always interests me to, to hear these things to go that's interesting because they're they're so into freedom they they freedom of expression freedom to run 
And they can be our mirrors in so many ways. They can complete us, but they can also be a reflection of us to say, yeah. here he is, okay. he's representing freedom. Wait, whoever could be whoever meets piece. him is like, he's pieces, totally your dog. But it, he's totally your dog. He is, like you say, he just, yeah, he, he's definitely a reflection of me, good or bad. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have two questions from the audience before we um, start to wrap up. Um, so the first one is, what's the most common thing a horse tries to communicate to its owner? Yes, so let me think of the direction I want to go in there. It's an, it's an interesting one. Let, I think I'm going to go with this one. So the horses are looking for us to be present. And that would be a commonality across the board, that a number of them want to communicate that we need to be totally present. So what does, it, what does that mean? It means don't have an earphone listening to music. Don't be on your iPhone. When you're riding, maybe do not have it playing in the background or take the calls. If you're riding, consider your horse. Now, some of them really don't care. They're probably happy. But if you're riding on the buckle and you're chatting, you're leaving them alone and they're on a jolly and they're having a great walk and so are you. But there will be other horses that truly want your presence to say, you know what? This is the only time we're connecting this week. We've got one hour to be together on a trail ride. Let's make it really nice where we're both seeing things, both looking around. I've seen individuals hold them tight in a frame on a trail. And it could be somewhat disheartening and even saddening because they want to look at the flowers. They might want to look at the view. I've got one horse, her name's Aria. She loves sunsets. She'll stop at the sunset. She watches flowers. And if I always tell my riders, if I've got somebody riding her, I'll say, please let her stop. It's her enjoyment to look at the flowers. And it's funny <laughs> because if you kick her at the wrong time, she'll pin her ears and she'll look back. Don't you dare. And then she'll go, oh, <laughs> and then you go, what about now? Oh, stop. And then when she's ready, she'll move. So the thing with giving the horses a voice, you're giving them a voice. You can't take it away once you give it to them. It, so they won't be robots anymore. They will be individuals. They might say, not today. I'm going to shimmy over. Not today. And you've got to make a decision like a steward, a guardian to go, well, you know what? You've had 30 days of not today and you're a bit tubby we've got to work you. So as a steward, we're coming to go, I know you're feeling a bit fat and procrastinating. I'm not going to ask you to do more that you can't do, but today I'm your exercise coach. And for that, I'm going to be rooting with you. So we take on different roles with them. We might be their nutritional health counselor. We might be their fitness person. We might be their guardian. We might be their companion. But as a steward, we have obligations. There will be horses that say, could you be an active steward, please? Don't just hand it all over to the barn. Be an active steward. Know what I'm eating. Know when I get turned out. They want that involvement. And that's a big, big thing when you've got a horse boarded. So the list is probably long. And if the, the person had said, list the top 10 things, there would be aspects like the phone and be involved. And another big one is take responsibility for your actions. You don't, don't just go, don't turn here, don't turn there, stop, slow down. No, be mindful, ride quietly and let them have a say. Different if you're in the performance world because you're teaching an athlete to jump. But still, you don't want to take the voice away so that they have to explode. You know, you don't want to do that. You want them to be an active participant in their lives and an active partner and partnership doesn't mean controlling and ruling them it means giving them a voice so they got an added bonus <laughs> there they got three probably top things that they might voice so the the opposite to that question it's our uh, last question from the audience is do owners often want to tell you to tell their horses something rather than the other way around always <laughs> always so what happens is i have what's class as a client intake form and it's important because as a communicator i'm wearing many different hats all of you know you study a long time to become a minister or a counselor a behaviorist even a vet tech 
you're, you're looking to bring lost animals home, etc. So as an animal communicator, it's a different hat that you put on to say, today I'm a minister because the animal's in transition. Tomorrow I'm actually talking to somebody on the other side, so I'm a medium. The next day I'm looking at behavior with a sloth. The next day I'm supporting a vet, helping in diagnosis. It might be rehab. You're wearing all these different hats. So when somebody reaches out, I need to know why I'm connecting. Otherwise, it would be rude. It's like bringing you into my office, just asking you a random question, which is quite disrespectful, really. So it's nice to have at least two sentences. So they fill that in to say, my horse is aging. I don't know when the time is. So at least I know how I need to speak. Here's my teaching voice. I've got my kind of interview teaching voice. But maybe that's not your voice to go, all right, love. You know, tell me what's going on with your horse and why you think he's he's going to leave. You know, not the voice. So I'd probably shift it to go, hi, I'm, I'm sorry to hear you're connecting in these circumstances. And it's a tad softer, tad different, right? Versus, well, he kicked me and you need to tell him. And the common statement clients make then is, could you just, could you just tell him not to kick? Could you just tell him not to run away? Could you just? No, I can't. Because, and it's not because I want your money, and it's not because I don't want to give you advice. It's not fair. I want to hear what they have to say. I've got to hear what they have to say. So every single session I have, there will be chances for questions and chances for messages. But many people, <laughs> it's funny, I'll tell a story on this one, it might not look, look, put me in a great light, actually. I was in New York, and I was... In New York, they call them limousines when you have a driver. So I was being picked up from the airport. It's really a cab, but they call it limo. So I'm in the limo and Vin calls me and he says, you're gonna get a call from a client and it's really urgent. And so she calls and she says, she says, I'm at the Hamptons with my daughter. She's currently competing and the horse is stopping at the jumps. Tell him not to. You should have seen me, I'm looking at the point going, you know what? And you know, you have to then breathe, smile, filter. Because I'm thinking, no, I'm not. And then I said, I said something like, is your daughter riding him okay? Look, the train has got him ready. She's riding. She just needs to win this. And I'm thinking, I'm so not the communicator for you. And I breathed again. I would have said, you know, we really need to not do it in the moment. Your daughter does need to learn to ride him correctly. And we need to set up a time figure out why on earth he's doing it versus simply just tell him to win and i said i'm so sorry i can't do that and you might want to find somebody else so it was that moment of aren't we not in it to learn to ride aren't we in it to learn a partnership don't we want to know why he's stopping is she at fault what's going on for him and no i will yeah. not tell him that that doesn't feel right to me so i'm, I'm very honest and I'm very clear of when we do this, we need to make sure we all hear what has to be said. Really, really important to do that. Okay, so so yes, every time, but, but you're meant to have questions. There's meant to be that time to say, could you ask him about all these things or could you tell him about this? And most people will have a set thing in their mind. They won't know what it is. It's not psychic. So I'm, I'm not a psychic. I'm not predicting what horse is coming into your life. I could do that for you, but that's not what we're talking about. So it's not about this horse will live to this age and you will compete and you'll do this. Not about that. It's about communication. I'm a counselor. I'm a communicator. So it's live and we want it to be interactive where you ask a question. He could ask a question from you. We share messages. It's a dialogue, and that's the big thing to realize. It's a dialogue, and it, it's Thank not a party you. trick. Thank you. So, so we're about to, to wrap up. We're out of time. Thank you so much for, for talking to us today. Any final thoughts that you'd like to leave everyone with? Any fun thoughts? One, when you, when you walk through the door of animal communication, there's no walking back. So whoever tuned in on this call today, or listens to it at any point in time, it means that you're ready to hear it. You wouldn't have tuned in otherwise. And once you walk through that door, you'll say, I'm willing to listen. The animals change immediately. As soon as you learn animal communication, as soon as your heart is calling you, 
if you've seen something on Facebook or it's crossed your desk and emails come in, or you suddenly realize that the individuals are congregating and they all seek you out, you start to have incredible experiences. We just had a snake um, show up on the doorstep, a six foot snake yesterday. And his message is, I know it sounds odd, right? His message is transmutation. It means that there's a huge, you're shedding the old skin and the news coming in, big change is on the door. So what happens is they start to show up and you realize that through their essence, they're telling you something. You don't see animals the same way. And animal communication doesn't begin and stop with horses. So what it doesn't do is you go, you know what, I'll tune into him and it suits me right now because I'm in the saddle. It's every time, any place, anywhere, the hummingbirds can show up. You know, you, you take care of the ants instead of stepping on them. All of these beautiful things to say, we're in this together. This is about all life. Then your world will never be the same. You will never be the same. 